the earlier time when we could still go to coffee shops and places like that actually that was a really <laughs> useful place for me memories <laughs> <laughs> back in the good old days Hello there and welcome to another Masterclass Monday. So today's topic is writing and more specifically how to get started. Now it's going to be a little bit of a different setup this week because as someone who's not had a huge amount of experience writing myself, I decided to call upon the immeasurably talented and accomplished writer Matt Beams to help me out and have a conversation about, I suppose, different tips and tricks and sort of things to bear in mind when you're starting out as a writer. So without further ado, enjoy the following tips and tricks from myself and Matt Beams. Hello everyone and welcome to what is a very, I suppose, very different Masterclass Monday than normal. Today we are talking about writing, as you can see from the sign behind me, and more specifically we are talking about sort of getting started or beginning to write a play sort of as a piece of work, kind of a few different tips, tricks, and I suppose reassurances on how to get started. So as someone who is eminently not qualified to talk about writing, I have brought along the wonderful Matt Beams. Say hello, Matt. Hello, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so I've brought along the wonderful Matt Beams. Matt, tell us a little bit about, I suppose, your experience as a writer, what you've done, that kind of thing. Okay. Um, so... I'm a principally a playwright, but write lots of other things as well. Um, have have written comic books and uh, prose fiction, questionable poetry, uh, and I've got other projects like I've worked on. I'm working on a board game um, and lots of writing in and around the actual mechanics of the board game as well. Um, I worked as an editor for people, and I work as a copywriter uh, as well, I'm building stuff for websites. Um, so lots of quite a broad experience of things, but my main focus has always been writing for theater. I've written a lot of work for young companies, so large groups and small groups of young people, uh, as well as professional touring productions of various sizes. So. To start off our discussion then, and you, you sent me a list sort of ahead of time of some mm. key points. I think there's 11 of them. Uh, that you thought were really key th or important things to know or to think about kind of leading up to it. And the first one, I must admit, I love it because it's almost identical to something I like to say <laughs> myself about any kind of play, sort of theatre making or creative work, which is uh, that there's, there's no right way, only established ones. And, that, and that's pretty much yeah. what you've said here. There's no one way to write a play. Yeah, um, because we are, as individuals, we are all different, uh, as, as Monty Python clearly put it. Um, and I think that I can certainly talk about the way that I work, but the way I work isn't always the same with every single play. I've written work that's been, that's come out of devised work. I've written work that's been adaptations and I've written stuff that's been, um, kind of original from my own brain um, and each time there's a slightly different way of approaching it but I have a I have a general rule of how I work but that might not work for everybody um, and it's not it's not the only way to do it and it's not necessarily the right way to do it it works for me and I think that's that's one of the most important things is just knowing that you as a writer or as a creative are yourself so you've got to you've got to find your approach your voice your way to work yeah and would, would you say that you found yours i suppose simply by by doing it or were there any kind of introspective activities that you engaged with um i think it's been quite an organic thing for me i've i've written a number of projects over the years and i've sort of settled into a pattern of a common practice for myself. So moving us on to point number two. So <laughs> here you mention sort of music as a way to sort of to help you find the the world or sort of the world you're writing in. And you tell us a bit more about that. I think, uh, yeah. I mean, I'm. I've been very fortunate in that one of my passions and my enthusiasms is uh, folklore and mythology, and I've had a number of opportunities to work creating 
pieces of theatre that are very much based on or adaptations of folklore and mythology. Um, and so you're creating a world in by creating a piece of theatre and by writing a script or anything. You're, you're creating a, a world where a story happens and sometimes it's useful to be able to get yourself into that world. And I personally find that music can be a really good way to do that. Um, particularly because there are so many soundtracks now and because you know it's not just films but it's uh, scores for games and things like that there are so many options and so many things available to kind of just help you find a world and it's even it, it's sometimes if you're I find if you can listen to something that brings you emotionally to the right place or just puts your head in the right space to be telling the story that you're telling it doesn't need to be a big change it might not be necessarily a logical connection if that makes sense but sometimes mm. it's just a it's a way of focusing and it kind of comes on in a way it links into the next point about physically giving your but we were giving yourself the time and the space to write but i think it's creating it helps create an environment for you to tell a story and even if that environment is kind of it's just inside your ears and inside your head as you're writing um, yeah it's something that i find very useful yeah, yeah. i mean as a as a kind of a practical example, I did an adaptation of Sleeping Beauty a couple of years ago, which drew very heavily on the original fairy tale, but also on Norse mythology and folklore. Um, so I was listening to a lot of kind of instrumental Scandinavian inspired and sort of Viking-y feel music because that was the world that I was trying to create and write into. So I think we probably talked a little bit about giving ourselves sort of time and space and things. So I might move us on to number four that you sent to me which i'm gonna i must i've got a shamefaced admission to come after you've come to talk a little bit about it which is um you've written the sort of stage directions they're not just for suggesting action but they communicate uh sort of a writer's intent so stage directions are an interesting thing and i think from my perspective um my the, for me the point of a stage direction is it is my way of telling the director and the actors and anybody else reading the script what I was seeing in my head and what my intention mm. is with that movement. It's about the communication of intent. That's the most important part. And I'm quite a visual person. And when I write, I tend to see everything happening. So the practice I've got into is that my first draft, quite often there will be quite a lot of stage directions. And some of them will be quite specific stage directions. Mm. Like, you know, to not, I've gotten myself out of the habit of goes over to the thing, makes a cup of coffee, stirs it twice. Da, da, da. I've, I've got out yeah. of that habit, but sometimes that's there, and it's in the initial drafts. That's because it's just because I'm what I'm, I'm putting what's in my head on the page, and then before my kind of my my initial rewrite and my initial edit is the draft that then will be seen by other people to get to that draft. Um, that's where I go through and I try and remove anything that's not necessary. So it's like, you know, my, mm. I don't need to specify the stirring coffee and things like that, but if it is important to the plot that a cup of coffee is made because it needs to get spilled over somebody later, then you need to have it as a stage direction. And yeah. so I think it's a, and there's, there's a number of times where I've written something and kind of have had the conversation with the director afterwards to say, this is, I, I've written this paragraph stage direction because there's this sequence of movement I see in my head which needs to do a thing. You might know a better way to do the thing. That was yeah. all I could think of. And so it's that in that case, those those are there because you know, something has to happen which achieves this thing. Mm. I'm only one person. You will have other, there will be other creatives in the room. That's the joy of theatre that you've got. Mm talented actors you've got a director all of whom will bring stuff to the table uh there are some directors who completely ignore stage direction because that's that's their practice that's how they've kind of been taught or that's how they develop their practice there are other directors who will follow them rigorously to the very letter um and i think those are both fine as schools of thought but i think that the kind of the the real way to do it is find a balance between the two because I try and leave stage directions in there so that they are useful in creating and telling this story. And so I think it's finding those and taking 
taking a stage direction as an in, as a statement of intent from your writer and then finding a balance and that that might be doing what the stage direction says or it might not be those are yeah. directorial decisions but as a writer it becomes an interesting challenge for you and but that's part of the joy of writing something is you see your words on the page and then you see them coming to life and sometimes you see things that you know because there are there's things you can only ever see in your own work when it's in somebody else's hands which i mean that comes on to further points um yeah but so I think that that neatly leads on to the next point, which is um, <laughs> the, <laughs> which is, I suppose, getting it read aloud, um, and yeah. sort of more specifically, if possible, get other people to do it for you. Absolutely. Um, so I think the the wonderful thing about writing is that you know you're in complete control because it's all inside your head, and it's absolutely you know you you do what you want to do. The really difficult thing about writing is that you're also in complete control. It's all your responsibility and it's all in your own head. Um, and, and, it, and it gets to a point, certainly I find it gets to a point where until I've been, I, I can't, I can't do any more with a script until I've heard other people saying it, until I've heard it outside of my head. Um, reading it aloud yourself is important because that helps you get, um, understand potential rhythm conflicts and things like that and flow of words and sentences but the other thing is that you've written it so you know how it's supposed to be said so you mm. have an advantage whereas if you give it to somebody else they will put inflection where you didn't expect inflection to be they will put interpretation there that you didn't necessarily see and and that that's again that's a thing that's really exciting about it because i think the first professional production i ever had was a three-hander and there were moments in that where the actors were, were giving the lines and saying the lines exactly as i'd heard them in my head and that was really reassuring for me as a writer because that had translated yeah then there were other circumstances where they'd found something completely different in that line and that you know a line that i'd written as angry had turned out to be hilarious and that is in a way even more exciting because then there's that interpretation and the fact that if your writing stands up to that and accommodates that that's really exciting for you because you're you know it then becomes that's the the collaboration shining through again as well it's other people creating and finding nuances in your story that you hadn't necessarily seen or hadn't expected i guess and it's maybe it's also worth saying that within that you also it's still yours and so you know the feedback is is feedback and you can listen to or not listen to dependent on who you are and so neil i don't know if i'm allowed to plug people but neil gaiman is a favorite writer of mine there's he's uh, he's given eight rules of writing, which I've got on my wall. And one of my favorite ones is, here we go. I will read it. Um, when people tell you something's wrong or doesn't work for them, they are almost always right. When they then tell you how to fix those problems, they are almost always wrong. Which I really like because it's the whole point of, you know, it is your story and your story might not work for somebody else, but if they fix it, they're starting to turn it into their story and it's yes. your story yeah and so i think it's just it's always you know feedback is fantastic and criticism and constructive criticism most importantly is really really useful you have the license and the freedom to take or not take to change or not change mm, so number six uh this wonderful point of if you need to we've got written if you need to move past a moment sort of I suppose encouraging people not to be afraid of that. You need to move past a moment. You can, because sometimes I suppose the the aftermath of whatever we you, whatever you're trying to imagine will help you find what that key event was. Absolutely, um, and it's a it's a practice again that I've I've got into. If I'm writing something and and I'll be in the mid flow and it's all going really, really well. And then I'll get to a point in a scene where a thing has got to happen. There is a moment of crisis or there is a, an obstacle that comes up or something has got to happen. I don't know what that is. My brain just, I can't, I can't work it out. 
and I sit there and I agonize over it. And then I understand, and in my head, I know exactly what happens afterwards, and exactly what the result of this thing is and how they recover from it. I just don't know what the thing is. And so I now, if I'm really struggling, I just put in my script, I write in block capitals, in bold, highlighted in yellow, a thing needs to happen where X needs to uh, learn about this or they need to achieve something. And just as a, you know, this is a thing that needs to occur. I don't know what the details of this thing are, but that needs to happen. And then yeah. I move on. Because if you agonize, I, you know, I can agonize over it and just panic and kind of dig yourself into a hole where you are staring at the screen and getting more and more stressed. Um, because actually sometimes I found that in then writing the reaction to it and the results of it actually helped me identify what it was, mm. which is a slightly backwards way of doing it. But sometimes yeah. it works. Sometimes yeah, it doesn't, I think but sometimes a, it does. I think it's a thing that holds fast, to be honest, for um, most, a lot of um, creative work across the board. Because I must admit, one of my key things that I do is if I've finally, if I've hit a point where I'm truly stuck, I cannot find the answer, I'll get up and go, to, go and do something else. What we talked about a little bit with sort of moving past a moment is it leads us quite nice, neatly on to sort of point seven and eight. And I think they come quite, quite wonderfully as a pair, which is, you know, sometimes it's easy to write and that's okay. And sometimes it's hard to write and that's okay. Yes. Yeah. And I, I think my, yeah, they were very much written as a, a duo. And I think the point I'm trying to make is that sometimes the words flow and the world is there and the dialogue is just it's happening and you can't type fast enough to capture it and that's wonderful and then there are days when it's the most agonizing thing in the world to put one letter after the other and that is also okay it shouldn't be incredibly easy all of the time and it shouldn't be incredibly difficult all of the time it's changeable in the you know we are we are we have good days we have bad days we have easy days we have we have easy white times of writing we have difficult times of writing and neither of them is more valid than the other you know i think it's easy to think that if it's coming so easily maybe it's not good if i'm not agonizing over it and that's that's not always the case sometimes if it comes out very easily you'll read it back and you go actually this isn't right yeah. This, this, you know, that sentence is good. The rest of it is rubbish, but you've still got that sentence. So that's good. And then other times it's like pulling teeth. But you are always, almost always too close to something. In the moment, if you're writing it and you feel it's rubbish, you're too close. You need to step away and, you know, yeah. accept that there are difficult times. Move away, come back. And it might still be rubbish when you come back, but there'll be something in there. There'll always be something in there. So you talked a, you talked a little bit about this already. Um, I suppose <laughs> almost in the sense of you've mentioned yourself that you've kind of done an adaptation of Sleeping Beauty and that sort of thing. And so you, so one of the points you've made sort of after the duo before is that you can rewrite something that exists, I suppose. It's, I mean, I suppose there is that um, initial thing that there's nothing new under the sun <laughs> kind of thing. I guess I, I think my, the point I was trying to make with this point, it was more that um, if you're turning out what you feel entirely confident is still rubbish, is complete dross, you can fix it because it exists oh. so i guess my point with it is was was don't lose heart halfway through a thing finish the thing and then look at it so um what was in my mind with this point really was i i wrote an adaptation of alice in wonderland and i really struggled with the end of act one was the crochet game mm. which not crochet game that's a completely different book uh the croquet game <laughs> so the croquet game which is this big scene and it's in the film and stuff and people remember it and know it and i was really struggling with how to do it 
and it was horrible because it was New Year's Eve as well. And so I missed New Year because I was trying to write this thing and it was just, I knew that it was wrong as I was writing it. I was writing a script, but it wasn't right. It didn't work. It wasn't going to work properly for the performance, but I pushed through and I pushed through and I pushed through on the basis that if I can get past the end of act one, I could start act two and I could get going and I could do the rest of it and it will be absolutely fine. And then I could come back and fix it later. Mm. And that is what I did. And, and similar to what we've said before, I got to the end once I'd, I knew it was wrong and it didn't work, but I didn't know how to fix it. And then I finished act two. And once I'd had the whole thing, I could see where that problem was and I could then go back and fix it. So I think, yeah, in a, a long convoluted way to get to my point, but this, this point was that even if you're 90% sure it's not right, if there are words on the page, you can fix the words on the page. If you give up and throw everything away, you've got to start again. So then we have we have sort of point ten, which is I think quite a quite a one that's prudent to be honest for I think all creative endeavours to be honest. But I think sort of more with the writing focus is sometimes the story changes in the telling. Can you tell us a little bit more? Yes. <clears throat> I think. Sometimes you will set out at the start of a story and go, I am going to tell a story. I'm going to write a play, which is absolutely about this person discovering that they are in love with that person and telling them. And sometimes that's the story you write. But most of the time, I don't think it is because other things occur. The story grows in the telling. The story changes in the telling. Certainly from, from my perspective, the world becomes more real the more time you spend in it. The more time you get to know these characters, the more more alive they become in your head. And so they kind of take over. They Their voices are real. And so sometimes it doesn't go the way you expect it to go. So Shocking, the last point you've... <laughs> <laughs> um, so the last point that you've uh, made is give yourself space between drafts. Yes. Yeah, it's it's that phrase, um, can't see the wood for the trees. Uh, and I think it, it's the same with a lot of creation in any way, you know, whether it's writing, whether it's devising a piece of theatre or directing something. If, if you are involved in a thing that has been made, you get to a point where you are so immersed in it, you are so close to it that you, you can't, you can't see it with an outside eye anymore. So you can't necessarily make the right decisions on it, or you, you can't necessarily be sure of your decisions. Um, and I think it's, it's certainly something that I've found that, you know, I will do, a, I will write a first draft. Um, so I have, I have two first drafts. I have my first draft, which is I've written the entire thing and then I've written the end. And then I put it down and I go away for at least a day a weekend or you know a bit longer if i can and then i come back to it to try and look at it with fresher eyes and then i go through it and that's where i go through and go right that i don't need those stage directions that's not important that's wrong that's not how you spell that word oh god all of those sorts of things and then that's that's my first first draft because that's the one that i will then show to somebody else yeah um but I think however many drafts you do, you need to give yourself yourself space and time to step away, to breathe, to come out of that world so that you can then step into it with a, a slightly different perspective and a fresher perspective. Question, because uh, I'm always a big fan of, to be honest, I'm a big fan of hearing professionals uh, be passionate about their work. What is your favourite piece of work that you've written and sort of a very sort of small explanation of why hmm. um oh god okay so i think it's down to two absolute favorites i think but if i had 
to choose between the two, I think it would probably be my adaptation of Sleeping Beauty, which was done a few years ago. And, and as to why, it was a story where the world came alive for me in the writing of it. And I, I didn't want it to finish and I didn't want to leave the world that, and these people that I'd met. And I had so much fun not writing them, listening to what they were saying and putting that on the page. Um, you know, I think that the character that I've had the most fun writing is in that play. Um, and uh, it was a, you know, there was a group, the, sort of the core group of characters were just people that I wish I knew and could meet in real life because they feel real to me. The world feels real to me. And I mean, so much so that I wrote, we, um, I wrote the script and told the director that I knew how these this central group of characters had met. And he said, well, if you could write some notes about that to give to the cast, that would be really good. So I started writing notes and ended up writing a 6,000 word short story about <laughs> them and telling the story of how they met, which doesn't happen in the play, it happens before the play. And um, because the world is just real and mm. alive and, and it came alive through the telling and it just felt like, yeah, the world exists. Um, and it's happened before and it usually happens when I write things, particularly if it's something that I'm really enjoying, I, you know, the world becomes alive to me, but this was, I didn't want to go, but I had to. Fantastic. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you have any further questions, then please do feel free to ask them in the description of this video. Also, if you have any suggestions about what you would like us to cover in our next masterclass, then please do let us know in the comments below this video or send it to education at litchfieldgarrick.com. Thank you very much and we'll see you next week. As always, stay safe, stay positive, and we'll see you soon.